The questions and video suggestions that I get the most are usually about recording vocals, and that is understandable. The vocal is undoubtedly the heart and soul of every song, so naturally people want to get this right. But up until now, I haven't done a vocal video because literally everybody has a vocal video. And it seems that what most people want is a video that says, here's how to record vocals and always get perfect results. Well, the truth is I can't do that. In fact, no one really can. Many of them approach their videos with that kind of confidence, and to be sure, there are a lot of great ideas and techniques out there. But if you watch one of those videos and decide to grab one of their ideas only to find that it didn't give you the results that you were looking for, it doesn't mean that engineer didn't know what they were talking about. It just means there were certain factors in your situation that made it not work. So it doesn't do any good to go to the comment section and blast the engineer for their incompetence. In fact, that doesn't help in any situation. Rather, it's an opportunity for you to take a step back and ask, why didn't this work for me? After all, what works for one person may not necessarily work for another. And in this video, we're going to explore why that is, and I'm going to approach this more like an FAQ, answering the various questions that come up when discussing vocals. Now, the honest answer about many questions about vocals is an unequivocal, I don't know. So in some cases, I'm going to reframe the question in a way that I can answer, like this. What's the best microphone for my vocals? I don't know. Can you recommend a good vocal microphone? Yes, the Neumann U67 reissue, which can be picked up for the bargain price of $7,000. Can you recommend a good vocal microphone between three and $500? Yes, I can do that too. So hopefully you see where I'm going with this. I can't answer the question, what is the best vocal microphone? Because for one thing, the best vocal mic for one singer is not necessarily going to be the best mic for another. And I have found this with my own recordings. For example, the U87 is by all accounts a great microphone, but for my singing voice, I don't like it. But for my voiceover work, U87. And of course, budget is another consideration. You may have had the opportunity to sing into a vintage Telefunken and love the results, but unless you're loaded or willing to put up a second mortgage on your house, that's probably not gonna happen. Don't mortgage your house for a microphone, just don't. Best advice I can give you here is one, define a budget and stick to it, and two, try before you buy. Go to the music store and see if they'll let you try it out. Or maybe you can rent one and record with it for a couple of days and see what you think. If none of those options are available to you, ask your online retailer about their return policy. I tried this mic at my friend's studio and loved it, but it sounds terrible in my studio. See, here again is one of those factors that is so difficult to predict. More than likely, this has to do with the acoustics in your studio. Should I put up some acoustic treatment? I don't know. Will acoustic treatment make a noticeable difference in my recordings? Probably, but it's also possible that there's an underlying structural issue that simple acoustic treatment can't fix. Now, the topic of acoustics is a big complicated mess, and most acoustic issues can be fixed depending on how much money you have to throw at it. But I'm assuming that the majority of you are not prepared to gut your house and hire Wes Laco to design a new studio for you. Although I'm sure Mr. Laco wouldn't mind. He does make very nice studios. So, real quick, let's listen to a few vocal examples here. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling From glen to glen and down the mountainside The summer's gone and all the roses falling it's you, it's you, must go, and I must bide. In each of those examples, I was using the same mic and the same placement, but clearly getting different results. Now, my point was not to say that one room is better than another, because while the first example was very reverberant, you might want it that way. But oftentimes what people want is to dry up the room, that is, make it less reverberant. This is ideal for voiceover and podcasting work, and for music, having a drier vocal means that you'll have more control over it in the mix. There's a lot of tricks of the trade for this. For example, some people set up their vocal booth in their closet, because the clothes will absorb a lot of those reflections. And an old broadcasting trick that many traveling journalists have done is to record their voiceovers in the hotel room with the bedsheet over their head. It's not ideal if you're claustrophobic, but it does work. But one method that yields pretty good results is building a vocal booth out of packing blankets. Just hang the blankets on some tall mic stands or a laundry cart or anything that'll hold them in the air, making a cozy little booth around yourself. You may want to put a lamp in here too because it can get dark and scary in here. So let's listen to the difference between this exact spot with and without the blankets. 
But come ye back when summer's in the meadow, or when the valley's hushed and white with snow. So yes, acoustic treatment will make a difference, but you have to decide whether or not it's necessary. Okay, moving on. How can I prevent mechanical vibrations and popping peas? I made a whole video about this and went a little bonkers in the process, but here's the short version. Shock mount, pop shield, and use a high pass filter. What about mic placement? And should I do anything differently since I'm recording insert your musical genre here? Regardless of genre, whether you're talking about rap, jazz, or screaming at the top of your lungs death metal, I tend to use one of two approaches. This, or this. I tend to use this method for songs that have more of an intimate feel to them, but you have to experiment and see what works for you. But don't rely on those behind the scenes videos for advice on mic placement. It's difficult to know which one of those shots are real and which ones are staged. And music videos are even worse. Directors ask people to do things with microphones that make recording engineers cringe. And sometimes it's just plain wrong, like this shot from Santana Smooth. That's a Sennheiser 409 and he's singing in the wrong side of the mic. I'd, probably because it looks prettier on camera, I don't know. Sorry, what was I talking about? Right, placement. So, experiment and find out what works best for you. And always use a pop shield and a high-pass filter. Next question. My singing is off pitch. Um, I have a few theories that you might not want to hear. When I sing live, my pitch is spot on. But in the studio when I'm recording, I struggle with pitch. Ah, got it. Well, that's most likely because you have headphones on. I covered this in an earlier video, but it's worth repeating. Part of our ability to discern pitch comes from reflections that we hear from nearby surfaces. But when you cover up your ears with headphones, you can't hear those reflections anymore. And for some people, that can affect their pitch. So two solutions for this, and you can do one or the other, or both. The first thing to try is to slide one ear off like this. Some headphones are designed to do this very thing. This allows you to hear the mix in one ear, while the other ear is picking up those acoustic reflections. And the second solution is to artificially create these reflections by putting reverb in the headphones. Should I record my vocals in stereo? Probably not. Generally speaking, you want your vocal to have a solid center. And if you record in stereo, any movement that you have from side to side will cause the center to swim, and it'll be distracting in the mix. But using a stereo reverb on your vocals in the mix is often a good idea. Should I be recording with a compressor? Yes, no, and maybe. It depends on what you mean by recording with a compressor. Now, a quick side note, if you don't know what a compressor is, go watch my video on compressors, and then come back to this. So, recording with compression. There's two methods here monitor compression and printing compression. Monitor compression means that the compressor is being added after the signal has been recorded. So you're hearing the effect of the compressor, but it's not being recorded. Printing compression means that the compressor is being inserted in the signal chain between the preamp and the recording unit. So the effects of the compressor are being recorded. Now that can be risky because if you decide later that you overcompressed, you can't get rid of it. So why would anyone do that anyway? Well, there once was a time when it was absolutely essential to add a compressor in your signal chain while recording certain instruments. Why? Because analog tape, while it sounded great, had a much smaller dynamic range than 24-bit digital. You had to get your recording level in that sweet spot with respect to the response of analog tape. Too high and you would get unwanted distortion and saturation, and too low you'd get poor signal-to-noise ratio. You'd get tape hiss on your recording. So if you had instruments like vocals that had a wide dynamic range, recording with a compressor was important. Today, however, with the dynamic range of 24-bit digital, it is really not necessary to print compression during the recording process. Now, you can if you want to, and if it works for you, great. In fact, there are other arguments in favor of printing compression that I won't get into because this video is already longer than I want it to be, but I will say this. Using a compressor while recording whether printing or monitoring, can help the vocalist get a better performance. Some of them say that it just feels better. Now, whether this is tangible or just psychological is certainly up for debate, but it doesn't matter. If it works, do it. Now, when it comes to mixing vocals, whether we're talking about singing, rapping, or speaking, I almost always use a compressor. Because of the wide dynamic range of the vocal, without compression, it's difficult to get it to sit in the pocket and be consistently on top of the mix. What about other effects on vocals like reverb, delay, chorus, EQ, distortion? All optional and subject to your personal taste and whether or not the song calls for it. So hopefully this video gave you an idea or two that you can use to make better vocal recordings. But don't get frustrated if you don't immediately get the results you want. Like any art or skill, this takes practice. If there's any one thing I want you to take away from this video is that there is no magic formula that will guarantee success for everyone.
The bottom line is you have to experiment. It's up to you to spend the time recording and listening.